Today's video is going to be ranking the discography of a band called King Crimson. King Crimson was founded in about 1969 uh, and they are still touring today. Uh, they have uh, been in various forms uh, since 1969 um, with various band members. Uh, so there's been a lot of changing in um, inside the unit itself. But what we're going to be talking about today uh, are the albums, and I'm going to be ranking them. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos on YouTube where I have um, made these album ranking videos, this is not necessarily to um, state which albums are the greatest, in you know, in my opinion. My album rankings are basically about my favorites and what I listen to most of the particular artist. So today's uh, King Crimson um, discography may, you know, shock or upset a few of you King Crimson fans um, or surprise you uh, due to what I choose. But again, these are not something that I'm ranking as a universal um you know, greatest albums by this band. It is only my personal choices and which albums that I choose to listen to the most and why. So without further ado, we'll get started with my least favorite King Crimson album, and that is Islands. Islands is basically, uh, I think it was their fourth album, and it's basically an album where... Uh, the band members have changed quite a bit, and the album is just full of slow jazz. And I really do like slow jazz, but this is like super slow stuff. This is very sleepy. It's a very sleepy album. If I wanted to go to sleep at night, I would probably put Islands on. Um, there's not much action on the album. And there's, you know, there's a couple of songs that, I mean, Islands this is, is good. I think Sailor's Tales off of this uh, album as well. It's, you know, it's just, it's a, not an album that I go to a lot because it just, frankly, it's boring to me. I mean, this is like a sleeper album. And I know there's a lot of talent that was put into making this album, just like any King Crimson album. It's just not something that I visit a lot. So my last place album would be Islands. Next would be uh, an, an album they released, I think, in... Ugh, I'm trying to think when that was. May, may have been 2000, 2001, called The Construction of Light. Again, I don't really listen to this album. There's a couple of songs off this album that I might go to. Um, it does have a very industrial-type feel to it, but it's just not something that I really go... I think um, my favorite song off this album would probably be uh, Lark's Tongues in Aspect Part 4, which is a very good song. Um, it is one of my favorite songs. But other than that, I mean, this album doesn't really have much to offer as far as I'm concerned. I don't really listen to it a lot. I don't go back and listen to it. Um, Prozac Blues is pathetic to me. I mean, I, I can't handle that song at all. Uh, but again, I love the lineup here. Um, there's a I mean, the album's okay, as far as I'm concerned, personally, but it just doesn't offer much for me. And so, you know, it's it's a little bit better than Islands, just due to Lark's Tongues and Aspect Part 4. But, you know, it would come after that. The next one is Beat. This was made in uh, 1982, I believe. And it is the 80s version of King Crimson. And you know, in the 80s, a lot of the bands from the 70s changed drastically we're talking about yes we're talking to even pink floyd changed drastically um genesis cha changed drastically so a lot of the bands uh from the 70s who wanted to continue their existence in the 80s had to sell out as they say and keep up with the times king crimson was a little bit different as they still maintained their i guess progressive chops uh, while putting out some accessible material for the pop audience of the 80s. Beat was the quintessential 80s pop album of King Crimson uh, with the hit Heartbeat. 
uh, which is again one of my favorite songs off the album. I do like Neurotica, which is a very basically as it's described, it's a very neurotic song. The chops that the guys brought to this uh, album, I mean, they uh, you still had Bill Bruford, you still had Adrian Ballou, you still had Robert Fripp, you still had Tony Levin. I mean, these guys are not. I mean, they are mastros at what they do. And a Beat is a great 80s album, but it's just not something that I go back and listen to a lot, other than I will listen to Heartbeat and Neurotica from time to time. I've tried to give this album a little bit more of a chance again, but not as opposed to the albums that I'm about to, uh, to talk about. The next one, for me, after Beat is called In the Wake of Poseidon. This was the second album by King Crimson. Now this album used to rank higher for me because um, I really love the song In the Wake of Poseidon, the title track, and I really enjoy uh, Cadence and Cascade, which is one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life. Um, but this album essentially is almost a replica or an attempt at a replica of the uh, original debut album. And so for that, I mean, it's still a great listen. It's still a, an album that I, I go back and listen to, but it's just, to me, it seems like it's more of a replica of the first album. And so it's not really, I would rather go back and listen to the first album. Uh, if I want to hear that type of material, but I will listen to, I will pull this album out from time to time. It's got great artwork. Um, you know, it, it also has a song called, uh, I think it's the Devil's Triangle, but it's basically the Mars Suite by Holst in King Crimson form. Very interesting um, track. Um, but again, I mean, this, just because I rank it this low doesn't mean that I don't go listen to it like some of the 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 ones I just talked about. I do listen to this album quite a bit, but I mostly listen to uh, the debut album because, again, this seems like a replica of the debut album to me. The next one is the 2003, I believe, album, The Power to Believe. Uh, it is, again, the, it is the uh, 2000s King Crimson, very industrial. Uh, I think Electric is on this album. I think uh, Level 5. Oh my goodness, I mean, this, the, the talent that goes into these songs, I mean, this, it is like the 90s version of Starless and Bible Black or Lark's Tongues and Aspic. I mean, they bring uh, the experimental side of King Crimson back, but it's in a 90s industrial format. It's, um, I mean... I probably listened to In the Wake of Poseidon a little bit more than this album, but this album was really um, an album that impressed me, especially after the construction of Light, and where I thought King Crimson had just lost it. Uh, but The Power to Believe came back and really changed my mind about the 2000s King Crimson. So The Power to Believe, uh, that is one of my favorite songs off the album. Uh, again, the, the songs that I mentioned. Uh, as well, happy to be what you have to be happy with, something or other of that nature. Again, I don't go back and listen to this album a lot, but it's uh, uh, the material from the album is really good. And so, um, as far as that's concerned, we'll move on to the next album. Now, this album could shock you that I've rated it so low. But again, you have to take into consideration that I'm ranking King Crimson albums, and I love King Crimson. So just because this album is ranked lower than perhaps what most people would rank it, I mean, many people would even rank it number one, um, it's not that I dislike the album, I really like it, it's just that I like some of these albums more. And that is Lark's Tongues and Aspic. Um, it's tough to rank this so low. Um, it is a very experimental side of King Crimson. I think Bill Bruford, it's when they bought, brought uh, Bill Bruford in from Yes!, um, very experimental. It does have the hit song Easy Money on it, which I really enjoy. Um, I enjoy the entire album. I mean, really like the entire album. Uh, but again, it's very, it's 
King Crimson getting into their experimental phase. It's a pioneering album, but um, you know, it's not something that that I go back and listen to as much. Again, my favorite songs off of it's probably Easy Money. Um, I do like Talking Drum. I do like um, Lark's Tongues and Aspic Part One a little bit better than Part Two, but I also enjoy Part Two. Uh, the next album again probably controversial that I'm ranking it ranking it so low but it's really not again it's not that I'm think you know badly of the album I really enjoy the album it's just I, I like some of the other albums better but that album is red uh, red is the one of the heaviest darkest albums by King Crimson uh, Kurt Cobain of Nirvana said that it was an influence in some of the music that he had done <clears throat> and there's only three members of the band um, John Wetton, uh, the bass player and vocalist, Robert Fripp, of course, he's always in there, um, and Bill Bruford. Um, it is very um, experimental, and but it does, it sounds almost like the King Crimson Garage Band um, album. Uh, the tracks I really enjoy, the title track, Red. Um, I also enjoy a Fallen Angel. Um, and Starless. Starless is a masterpiece. Um, it's really hard for me to rank it this low because just because of Starless, but um, I really enjoy that. I, I'm not a big fan of One uh, one, red, one More Red Nightmare. I don't like Wetton's vocals in that song. I don't like the composition of that song. Um, but again, Red would rank here. Uh, this was very tough because I wanted to rank Red over this album just because, but uh, there's more songs off this album that I like, and that's Starless and Bible Black. It's a very experimental album, but there's not really a weak song on the album. Um, I love Fractured. I love um, Starless and Bible Black, The Mincer, um the Great Deceiver, I'm not real crazy about. That's the opening track. But overall, the album's just solid to me. Uh, it's very experimental. So if you're not into experimental music, uh, you probably will not like this album. You probably want to go with Red instead. But um, again, it is one of the albums that I really go back to and listen over and over and over. I really enjoy it. Uh, it's not for everybody, though. The next album is, this one was tough for me to rank so low. Again, I know I'm saying that, but Lizard. This was the third album by King Crimson. Again, this was when I think they started kind of getting into more of an experimental phase. Not as much as Lark's Tongues and Aspect, but they, they kind of started there. The one thing that I really enjoy about this album, it's unlike any other album you'll ever hear. It's very King Crimson. Uh, and you'll know what I mean once you hear it, but the production is excellent. It is probably my favorite album production-wise by King Crimson. I love the production of this album. And the songs are so unique. And it has, they even have John Anderson from Yes singing one song. And it is the uh, side two is only one song and it's Lizard. It's the, the sweet I think it's the only one King Crimson ever made where they had an album with a few songs on one side and one one song on the second side of the album. Um, but Lizard Circus is one of my favorite songs. I, I enjoy Happy Family pretty good. Um, Lizard, of course, um, I really enjoy that. But you really have to listen to this album. I highly recommend it for anyone who wants to just check out music that's just different. I mean, this is something that, that it's like a combination of what medieval music would sound like mixed with rock music. It's very interesting. Um, so then, next in line, it was really hard for me to rank Lizard that low because I almost want to say it's tied with this next album. They could almost flip flop at any point. But the next album in line, um, number four, I believe, is Thrack. 
This was the only album King Crimson made in the 1990s. I think it is a very underrated album. Uh, again, it's got the experimental sound, but it's got more of a um, accessibility, uh, much like most of the 80s King Crimson when Adrian Ballou came in. It's very accessible uh, to the general public. People can pick out songs that they really enjoy. There's, I think, one, I think one time's off this one. Um, one time, Dinosaur is probably their biggest uh, song off this album, and I really enjoy that song. Uh, but there's several great, and there's not a weak song on this album, on Thrack. Um, the tour, the 95 tour, you need to watch the um, King Crimson in Japan in 1995. Excellent show. Um, but Thrack is, comes in uh, number four. Um, the 90s King Crimson had just enough of the bite to it where they could still bring their prog credentials in, but it was very, um, it was, it was that alternative type of sound, but it was, it was grungy. It was rock. It was, you know, you just, you just have to listen to it. Thrack. Okay. Now we're getting down to the final albums. Um, and this was so difficult for me. I could not rank one over the other. So there is a tie for second and third place, I suppose, between the 1981 King Crimson comeback album, Pioneering. This is a, an album that is one of the greatest albums of the 80s. Uh, every song on the album, well, most every song on the album I really enjoy. Um, and it has my favorite King Crimson song on it called Frame by Frame. And that album is called Discipline. And it is tied with the 1984 album that was released um, by the same group of people in the band. Again, it was Adrian Blue, uh, Bill Bruford, Robert Fripp, and Tony Levin. And the album's called Three of a Perfect Pair. I love every song off this album. It's probably the album I listen to more than any other King Crimson album. Uh, the songs are very much like Discipline, except they're a little bit more fleshed out. Um, several tracks I enjoy off this album. But Discipline, going back to Discipline, my favorite songs are Frame by Frame. That's my favorite King Crimson song of all time. Uh, Mate, uh, Mate Sai. Um, Sheltering Sky, I really enjoy that. The only thing, the only criticism that I have why I couldn't really rank it over three of a perfect pair is because I'm not a big fan of the talkies. And when I say the talkies, I'm talking about the songs that Adrian Ballou talks through, such as Elephant Talk and um, Indiscipline. I love the songs, and the music's great. I'm just not a big fan of talking through. A, I, I, I prefer singing. Uh, to a song, but that's my again my personal preference. Um, but I couldn't rank it over Three of a Perfect Pair because of that. I couldn't rank Three of a Perfect Pair over Discipline because Discipline was the album that brought me into the 80s King Crimson. Uh, it has my favorite song off of it, and every song on it is very powerful. Um, so I just couldn't I couldn't choose between the two, so I had to cheat and make them both ranked two and three kind of tied simultaneously. So that leaves the number one album, and many King Crimson fans will know what this one is right off the bat before I even say it. It is the debut album in the court of the Crimson King. Uh, this album is a masterpiece. It is a pioneer for progressive rock coming out of the psychedelic era in 1969. Um, every song off, the, off this album I really love every song, including Moonchild, which is the one that everybody throws under the bus. Every song, the production is very good. Um, I love every song off this album, uh, In the Court of the Crimson King, and um, I Talk to the Wind are probably my favorites. But uh, 21st Century Schizoid Man is still to this day. I mean, that, that song was so far ahead of its time that you can still listen to it today and it doesn't sound dated. Uh, Epitaph 
is a masterpiece of uh, existential poetry. Well, much like I Talk to the Wind, both uh, masterpieces of existential poetry put together with that that King Crimson sound that nobody had even heard. I mean, nobody even thought you could sound that way back in 1969. So they brought something new to the table. This album is something that I listen to over and over again. I can listen to it in, you know, with headphones with my eyes closed, deeply listening, or I can put it in the background. I mean, just there was no way I could rank any other album over this album. It was the one that introduced me to King Crimson, and to me it is their greatest album. And it is the album I listen to the most. And that is In the Court of the Crimson King. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed my ranking the discography of King Crimson uh, based on my personal taste. Uh, if you enjoy the video, you can like it, leave some comments, um, subscribe to the channel. I'm going to try to get this ball rolling a little bit better. So uh, until next time, thank you guys for listening.